In today's video, we get to move on to chapter two, um, where in chapter two, we're going to focus on how we use derivatives. Um, up to this point, we learned about, okay, what is a derivative? Where does it come from? And how do we calculate derivatives for functions? But now we get to learn uh, where are derivatives actually useful? How do we use them in, in different situations? Okay, and so the first one we're going to talk about is local extrema. Now, by extrema, I'm just talking about extreme values, okay, minimums and maximums. Okay, those, these are considered extreme values. Okay, your absolute highest point in your function, your absolute lowest point in your function, that kind of thing. Okay, uh, these points are very useful to know in a lot of different disciplines. If you just think about business, dis business applications, if you have a, uh, a company and you are able to come up with a profit function or a revenue function, it might be helpful to be able to calculate the maximum of that revenue function so that you can maximize your revenue. And similarly, if you have a cost function, it would be helpful to be able to calculate the minimum of your cost function so that you can minimize your costs. So maximum and minimums are, are usually very, very useful to know. So let's talk about how we can find these maximums and minimums. Uh, consider a graph or a function. Sorry, consider a function. Let's look at negative x cubed plus 5x squared plus 8x minus 3. Okay, Here's this function. Now, if we want to find a maximum minimum, maybe it's probably helpful to graph it, right? Graphing might be helpful, so let's go ahead and graph this function. Okay, uh, this is going to be my, of course, this is not going to be exact at all, but it looks something like this. And it's a cubic function. Cubic functions have this type of shape. Okay, so I, I can see that, well, first of all, these arrows tell me that there is no absolute highest point and there is no absolute lowest point because these arrows mean that it goes all the way up to positive infinity and all the way down to negative infinity. But I do have these two points, okay? And we call these points local extrema. So this would be my local minimum and this one would be my local maximum. We use that word local to, to say it is the maximum if you're just looking in this specific region. It's the highest point in this specific area. Same thing with that local min. It's the lowest point in this specific area. So that's what this word local is all about. Okay. What's my max and min for a specific area? Okay. So I do have a local min and I do have a local max. Well, how can I find that? Well, if I just have a graph, I can maybe try and see what x value that lines up with. Of course, I don't have that capability with my hand-drawn graph, but if you're using a graphing calculator, you might be able to do that. But that gets hard if it doesn't line up on a whole number. So is there a way that I can calculate it without having to rely on the graph? Well, it turns out we're going to use something we learned in chapter one, which is derivatives, right? How does this relate to derivatives? Well, let's, let's take a look at how this relates to derivatives. Let's focus in on this local max. What's happening before the local max? Before the local max, the values of my function are increasing. And after my local max, the values of the function are decreasing. Okay. Well, let me ask you a question. If my function, so I'm using f because this is true for any function. If f of x is increasing, what can you tell me about the derivative? Right? We want to relate this to derivatives. So if my function is increasing, what can you tell me about the derivative? The derivative represents the rate of change at a specific point, right? The slope at a specific point. So if my function's increasing, then my derivative is positive. Let me just, just to be clear, I'll write positive under that. My derivative is positive. 
Similarly, if f of x is decreasing, then the derivative is negative. Well, this begs the question, what's happening at the local max? What's my derivative at the local max? Well, what number is right in between positive and negative values? Zero. At the local max, my graph flattens out, and I have an instantaneous slope, or I have a derivative of zero. Notice how if I draw the tangent line, my tangent line ends up being horizontal. It has a slope of zero. This is true for the minimum as well. At that minimum value, the slope ends up equaling zero. So, the way that local extreme accelerated derivatives is based off of this observation, that at these maximums and minimums, the derivative is equal to zero. So, going back to my function, right, like I said, we don't want to have to rely on a graph. So, going back to my function, can I calculate the derivative just use, or sorry, Sorry, can I, can I find these local minimums and maximums without using the graph? I can by calculating the derivative. So let's calculate the derivative. Just a polynomial, which means I can just use my power rules. I get negative 3x squared plus 5 times 2 is 10x plus 8. Derivative of negative 3 is just 0. Okay, so there's my derivative. And like we said... I have these local max and local min occur when my derivative is equal to zero. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set this derivative equal to zero. And what it gives me is an equation that I know how to solve. I might need to refresh my memory. Like this goes back to algebra two. Um, how do I solve something like this? I need to find the roots. I need to find the roots of this polynomial. So a uh, couple different, since this is quadratic, I can use the quadratic function, or the quadratic, sorry, the quadratic equation. I can use the quadratic equation to solve this. Or if I know how to factor it, I can just factor it. To make life easier for me, I'm going to factor out a negative. Just because I find it easier to factor when your leading coefficient is positive. Okay, and then that factors into 3x plus 2 times x minus 4. Okay, okay interesting. Uh, now, this negative, I can, I can just call it like a negative 1 that I'm multiplying out in front. And then if I divide both sides by negative 1, what happens? I just, I'm left with just 0. So what I'm saying is the negative actually doesn't affect what these roots are. Okay. Okie doke. Now that I factored it, it's fairly straightforward now to go ahead and figure out what the roots are. I get x equals 4 and x equals negative 2 thirds. Well, guess what? If I come back over to my graph, um, and I know this just because... This is my function, but we're going to talk about how I can know which one's which. But for now, I'll go ahead and tell you the x value for my local max ends up being 4, and the x value for my local minimum ends up being negative 2 thirds. So sure enough, by, sol by setting the derivative equal to 0 and solving, I was able to come up with the, two x, the, the x values where my maximum and minimum occur. Okay, so let's summarize here. Um, let's see if we can summarize what we just learned. Okay. Um, I can use the derivative to find local extrema, right, minimums and maximums, to find minimums and maximums, by doing what? By finding where the derivative is equal to zero. Okay, and 
I'm going to put in parentheses because we're going to look at an example where this is true, or undefined. Um, in our case, uh, there, was no, there was no points where the derivative was undefined. The derivative was continuous everywhere. Okay. But, so that's kind of the bottom line and the big idea of this chapter, or this section, is we can use the derivative to find these minimums and maximums by finding where the derivative is either zero or undefined. Okay, so okay, so I just mentioned that there are some situations where the minimum or the maximum can occur at a spot where the derivative is just undefined. And so let's look at an example of this. Consider the absolute value function. Hopefully you guys already know what the absolute value function looks like on a graph, but I'll dra graph it anyway. The absolute value function ends up looking like a V when you graph it. Okay, and it's because at its root, the absolute value function is really a piecewise function. Okay, well, the absolute value function has a minimum. It has a minimum right here. It has a local minimum, which also happens to be the absolute minimum, at x equals 0. Well, tell me about the derivative at x equals 0. Because the absolute value function creates a v-shape, the derivative is actually undefined at x equals 0, right? Because my function is not smooth there. So your function can still have minimums or maximums at spots where the derivative is undefined. So keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. Let's, tr let's look at another function. Let's look at another example. And we'll keep going with this idea. So consider this function. Lowercase g of x is equal to negative 2x to the fourth uh, plus 12x squared minus 10. And our goal for this one is we're going to try and do this without looking at a graph. We're going to try and come up with the minimums and maximums completely using algebra, using mathematics. Okay, let's review what we've learned. We can use the derivative to do this by finding where the derivative is equal to zero. So let's take the derivative of this function. I get negative 8x cubed plus 24x. And what did we say? We can do this by finding where the derivative is equal to zero. So I'm going to go ahead and set this equal to zero. Throughout a lot of chapter two, we're going to be using this process over and over and over again. Find the derivative, set it equal to zero. Find the derivative, set it equal to zero. Because it's the fundamental idea behind finding these minimums and maximums. Finding the derivative, set it equal to zero. So that's what we start by doing. Find the derivative, set it equal to zero. Can I solve this? Absolutely, by factoring. I can factor this. Uh, both my terms have an x in it. Both of my terms have a multiple of 8. So I can factor out an 8x. And I'm actually going to factor out the negative as well. Okay, So I get negative 8x. Why did I switch colors? I get negative 8x times x squared minus 3. If you want, you can double check my work. But that's what I get. Okay, That splits it up into two separate equations that I can then solve. to figure out what my roots are. This first one, of course, just gives me x. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. This first one just gives me x equals 0. So there's one of my roots. And then my other one, oops, sorry, gives me x equals positive or negative square root of 3. Right? Either of those x values will cause x squared minus 3 to equal 0. Okay. So I have three possible places where a minimum or maximum could occur. Now, why do I use that word possible? Okay. Well, it turns out just because my derivative is equal to 0 doesn't necessarily mean I have a local minimum or local maximum. Consider this function. Consider x cubed. 
okay? X cubed is interesting because if you were to graph X cubed, just X cubed, nothing else, you get this shape, okay? And this shape flattens out so much at zero that it turns out the derivative here is actually equal to zero. My problem is, is that's not a local max or a local min. It's just, it's just this point where it flattens out. So it's possible to have points where the derivative is equal to zero, but the graph's not actually creating a minimum or a maximum. So it's important that we, we recognize that. These points, are not they're not necessarily minimums or maximums, but, but it's, that's where, if my function does have a minimum or maximum, it, it's going to occur at one of these points. Okay, so because there's that difference, we actually have a name for these points. These points are called critical points. Okay, so if f prime of c is equal to zero, so if I find a, an, an x value such that the derivative is equal to zero, then we call c a critical point. Okay, so there's some vocabulary there. Critical points, they don't necessarily uh, uh, guarantee that it's going to be a minimum or a maximum. So what do we do next? You might be thinking, oh, well, now we can throw it on a graph and see what happens. But the whole idea of this is we're not going to use a graph. Let's do this without using a graph. Instead, what I can do is I can come back to this idea. Okay. I can test where my function is increasing or decreasing. By testing increasing or decreasing, I can actually figure out whether my point is a minimum or a maximum. Okay. So let's test where the function is increasing or decreasing. Without looking at a graph, I can use the derivative to test that. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a number line to help me out, to help organize my information. I'm going to make a number line to help me out. Now, there's already points on this number line uh, that, well, I guess I, you, I guess I might be wondering, well, am I going to, I don't want to test out every single point. I don't want to test uh is there, is there a way to clean this up to know exactly where to test to see where my function is increasing or decreasing? Well, I can actually use these critical points to help me out. So I'm going to put my critical points on the number line. And now I'll test numbers in between to see what my function is doing. Is my function increasing, decreasing? or decreasing in these, in these intervals in between. So let's try, let's look at this first interval way, way over here, okay? All I need to do is just pick a number somewhere in this interval, so I can pick maybe negative 10. Negative 10 is safely way more negative than negative square root of three. And I'm gonna test to see if my function is increasing here. Now, if I plug in negative 10 into my original function, that really doesn't tell me anything. It's just going to tell me what the y value is there. It do, that's not going to tell me whether it's increasing or not. Instead, I can plug it into the derivative. Because if the derivative is positive, that means I'm increasing. If the derivative is negative, that means I'm decreasing. So... I'm going to plug this in. I'm going to plug negative 10 into the derivative. Let's see what that gives me. Oops, sorry. Negative 10. Okay, now the computation, you can, of course, use a calculator to help you out here. But you might be, you might be a little scared of this because oh, it's going to be pretty big numbers. But let's be clear here. All I'm worried about is whether the derivative is positive or negative. 
So that's all I'm really gonna. Um, that's all I'm really gonna look at. Twenty four times negative ten is negative two forty. Negative ten cubed is like a thousand, and a thousand times, or sorry, is negative a thousand, and negative a thousand times negative eight is positive eight thousand. Okay, so I end up getting a really large positive number minus a smaller minus a smaller number. Overall, this is greater than zero. Right? I, I end up with a positive value. So what is my function doing before it hits negative square root of three? My function is increasing. Okay, or actually, you're right. Why did I put that plus sign there? My function is increasing. I put the plus line there because my derivative was positive. That's why I put it there. Okay, okay now let's test a point in this interval. An easy one to test is negative 1. Negative 1 is right there in between 0 and negative square root of 3. So plug it in, I'll plug it into my derivative and see what I get. So g prime of negative 1 is equal to negative 8 times negative 1 cubed plus 24 times negative 1. Let's see what that gives me. That Well, that's just going to be negative 1 cubed is negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 8 is positive 8. 24 times negative 1 is negative 24. Ugh, I end up with a number that's less than 0. So my derivative was negative, which means my function is decreasing. Okay, well, let's keep going. This interval, I can pick positive one. Okay, plug positive one in, and I get something very similar. Okay, uh, g prime of positive one, I get negative eight times one cubed uh, plus 24 times positive one, so I get negative eight plus 24, which is greater than zero. So my derivative was positive, which means I'm increasing. Last but not least, I just need to pick a number greater than square root of 3, so I'll pick positive 10. g prime of positive 10 gives me negative 8,000 plus 240, which is less than 0. So this is negative, which means I'm decreasing. Okay. So... Using that first derivative, I was able to figure out where my function's increasing, decreasing, increasing, uh, or where it's decreasing. And I noticed that at negative square root of 3, so at this, oops, sorry, at this x value, my function switches from increasing to decreasing. If I were just to sketch that, my function is increasing before negative root 3 and decreasing after negative root 3. What does that tell me about my critical point of negative root 3? It tells me that I have a maximum. It tells me that my function has a maximum at negative root 3. So negative root 3 uh, so oh, actually, let me let me word this differently. So a local maximum occurs at negative root three. Okay. Well, take a look at zero. What's happening at zero? At zero, my function is decreasing and then increasing. Okay. I'm, I'm decreasing and then increasing, which means I have a minimum. So a local minimum occurs at x equals zero. And then if I look at my last one, I'm increasing then decreasing again, just like what happened at negative root 3. And so um, uh, 
positive root 3 would also be a local maximum. So this process we just went through to determine whether these critical points were maximums or minimums is called the first derivative test because we use the first derivative to test the intervals in between to see whether my function was increasing or decreasing, and then I can make my decision based off of that. So to wrap up, what I wanted to do is go through a step-by-step -step process of how we do go about this. So if I want to find the local minimums and maximums of a function, what is my process? What steps do I take? First, find the derivative, right? This is a great first step. When in doubt, find the derivative, calculate your derivative. Okay, that derivative is always gonna be helpful. So that's what we started by doing. We started by finding the derivative. And then remember, what do we do with that derivative? These local extremas occur when the derivative is, equal, is either zero or undefined. So I want to set the derivative equal to zero. Step three, solve. And these points that I'm solving for, what are they called again? They're called my critical points. Okay, these points where the derivative is either equal to zero or undefined. Okay, now this is kind of my halfway point because now I know where the function could have local minimums or maximums and now I need to figure out what are these critical points? Are they minimums? Are they maximums? To do that, what do we do up here? I created a number line. So next, I'm going to create a number line. And what numbers did I put on that number line? Um, the critical points. Create a number line with the critical points included. Perfect. OK. And now I need to test those intervals in between to see whether the function's increasing or decreasing during those intervals. And to do that, you'll pick a number or a value in each interval and plug it into what? into the derivative. Okay. Once again, the purpose behind this is to determine what the function is doing in that interval. Is the function increasing or is the function decreasing? This is two. So let's see. To determine, so let me just continue this. To determine the behavior, okay, and I'll put in parentheses increasing slash decreasing of the function in that interval. Okay. Once I have that information, once I know what the function is doing uh, in between, I can, I can make my conclusions about whether uh, the function or whether the critical points are minimums or maximums or neither. So that's my step-by-step -step process. Okay, try out, go ahead and try out some of the homework problems and then reach out if you have any questions.